Well, hello again, my sequestered classes. Um, we're going to talk about chapter one today. Textbook, Stephen Lucas, Public, The Art of Public Speaking, 13th edition. Okay? That's the book you need to get. You can get the electric and electronic version. You can get the paper version, whatever you want. We're going to talk about chapter one right now. Chapter one discusses... Um, speaking in public. And believe it or not, you do it every day. Every day, you talk in public. A lot of students, I can't talk public speaking. I, I, you can, because you can do it. You do it without understanding or realizing it's public speaking, but you publicly speak every day. So let's talk about a few of the things. The, the, Similarities in, in public speaking and conversation and differences. Now, public speaking has traditions that go back centuries. And many people um, consider it one of the first academic subjects. And you had the sophists in the, in the Greek times where they drove around and they tried to... Every man had a boat. Now, women didn't have boats, slaves didn't have a boat, but every man had a boat. And every man could speak. And you actually had some people going around teaching them to speak better to be able to persuade somebody else to see it their way. <laughs> Much like the politicians we have now. Many of them have training to be a good speaker. Now, there's some preliminary, preliminary, preliminarities and differences. See, it's okay to mess up. I've been talking for a long time and I still get messed up sometimes. Uh, between public speaking and conversation. Number one is the organization. When you publicly speak, you should have your organization of what you want to say laid out. You should have it ready to go and practice it. I can't, I can't stress that enough. You have to practice public speaking. You tailor it to your audience. And, and that's a similarity because, you know, you tailor your conversations every day to your audience. If you're asking your mom and dad for 20 bucks, you are going to ask differently than if you ask a friend for 20 bucks. If you're discussing where to go to a restaurant with your significant other, it's a different conversation than where to go to a restaurant with your boss. You tailor your conversations. We always speak in narratives. And long before the written word came around, people were telling stories. You know, and, and that's how we learn is through storytelling. And I often use stories from my past, <clears throat> excuse me, to try to express a point uh, in communication. And and we use adaptive feedback. You adapt to feedback in a conversation, and you adapt to feedback in public speaking. If you're having a conversation with your boss and they keep looking at their watch, you know. It's telling you that their time is important and hurry up. It's feedback. When I'm teaching in a classroom, about 10 to 15 minutes before class is over, I generally hear the distinct rattle of keys. It's students' way of saying, you know, I'm packing my stuff up. We need to go. You need to shut up. So we get feedback all the time. Now, the, the difference, biggest difference is, is Public speaking is highly structured, and you use much more formal language, and you have a slightly different delivery. You know, when you're talking to your friends, you can be laid back and playing on your phone and staring at the ceiling. You can't do that when you're doing public speaking. You have to sit up straight if you're sitting down or stand up and project an air of confidence in your delivery. You've all, I'm sure, heard public speakers that sounded unconfident. It didn't give you much enthusiasm to listen to what they had to say. Remember that nervous is normal. It's perfectly normal to be nervous, and nine times out of ten, your audience doesn't see it. I see it because I look for it. But I'm nervous. The first video you saw of me, I was nervous. The first day I walk into class, I'm nervous. I've given presentations to heads of state, but I'm still nervous. And it's normal because you care. 
the best way to deal with, with nervousness is to deal with it, is to get exposed to it, is to experience it and realize that you can do this. And then most importantly, and I'm going to express this 150 times during this class, practice, practice, practice. Don't write your speech five minutes before you're going to video it or five minutes before you're going to get on the floor in the classroom. Write it ahead of time. Get to know it. Understand it. And don't try to memorize it. You know, you've all seen those videos on TV or the movies at the end of the trailers, at the end of the movies, the, the bloopers. They get paid millions of dollars and they forget. You're not getting paid anything, unfortunately. I can't afford to pay you for this class. I'm sorry. But practice. Practice and know the material. Don't, tr don't try to memorize it. Know what it is. You need to think positive. When I was young, we had something called pep rallies. And I know they still have them because my grandkids go to them. Man, it makes me sound old. But they have pep rallies. You ever heard of pep rally start? We might do this. Oh, they're going to crush us. No, you don't. It's positive. We're going to win. We're going to win. We're going to beat them. We're going to crush them. You know how many students I've heard talk themselves out of a speech? I can't do this. I can't do this. I can't do it. Yeah, you can. You can do it. Remember that you're not perfect. You're going to mess up. But if you try to memorize something and mess up, you get all flustered. If you know the material and you mess up, you can recover. The process. There's the speaker. Message, channel, listener, feedback, interference, situation. All those are things that make up the process. The speaker in this case is me. The message is chapter one. I'm talking about that. The channel, YouTube video. The listener is you. Unfortunately, I can't get feedback from a video. That's why I don't like this for public speaking. Uh, I think it misses a few things, but the powers that be said, Vern, go teach that class. And I said, okay, so I'm going to try to make the best I can. It's difficult when you don't get feedback because I don't know what's going on. Interference is called noise. Now it could be background noise at my end. It could be background noise at your end. It could be static. It could be buffering, anything that interferes with the message in communication is called noise. It doesn't have to be audible. <clears throat> and, <clears throat> excuse me, the situation, an online class. Now, <clears throat> you could fill those blanks in with anything. If you were in an auditorium speaking to people. You know, I, I was at UL working on my master's and the professor told me I had to teach the auditorium class, which had 250 students. And I'm thinking, I'm good. He knows I'm qualified. He said, no, you got a big mouth. You can reach it back of the room. So it kind of burst my bubble. But I was trying to teach a class to a large group. And I was trying to look, you know, when you publicly speak, you're supposed to look at people and talk to them. I was trying to look at the people. And, and my first time I did it, it was rough because there was 250 people in there. How am I going to look at all of them? And most of them are a blur. But I still got feedback from them. I could scan the room. Some of them were asleep. Some of them were playing on their phone or their iPad. Some of them were paying attention. Some of them were writing in a notebook, whether they were writing notes or something else. I don't know. But I got feedback. You have to understand cultural diversity. <laughs> I love culture. Culture is something you can't go to the store and buy. It's not tactile. You can't hold it. But it affects every bit of every person's life. It's just like rubber bands wrapped in, in a ball. Each rubber band changes the mass and density of that, that ball and how it reacts to outside stimulus. Your cultural experiences changes how you react. You may act differently than somebody in your family that has never been out of the country. Or somebody in your family that... Um, has never had to work for anything. But if you understand what's going on, <clears throat> you can understand that 
cultural diversity is is wealth. If if you become more diverse, you can talk to more people. Uh, you can you can understand more things. It, it it's wonderful, you know. To, to be able to listen to different genres of music and understand it. I love music. I don't, I can't carry a tune in a bucket and I don't sing. My grandson asked me not to actually, but I love different types of music as long as I can learn something from it and from the culture. And avoid ethnocentrism. It seems to me there's a lot of that going on in the United States, you know, like America. America, we're great. Yeah, we're okay. <laughs> I mean, it, it's a great country. I love it. I'm proud to be an American. I fly a flag in my yard. I was a soldier for 20 years. But there's a lot of other people in other countries that have a lot of good that they can bring to the table. And if you automatically count people out because they aren't the same, then you're hurting yourself. And that's it for chapter one. Uh, I'm going to post another video for chapter two. Take a look at it, read it, understand it. Um, and remember that it will be on the final. Uh, and it will be a proctored final. So take your time. Go through the book. If you have any questions, email me. And I'll be happy to answer them. That's the only way I'm going to get feedback is if y'all email me. If I said something didn't make sense or if something didn't make sense in the book, email me. And we will have it in a frequently answered questions thing or a Zoom text chat or something. But we'll get to the bottom of it, okay? Thanks. Have a great day.